Hey there, my name is Evgeny, and I'm a tech art lead at Crazy Panda, which is a uh, mobile game development oriented uh, company. And today, I'd like to tell you about tech art and our experience in dealing with it. Um, specifics aside, I'd like to start with why I am here and what I want to accomplish from this talk. First and foremost, I'd like to promote tech art in general, because while it is gaining popularity as more and more companies uh, integrate tech art and tech artists into their workflow, still a lot of people see it as a gimmick or a tool for AAA only. And I'd like to do my small part by uh, showing you that that is not the case. Second, I'd like to promote Blender as a tech art tool and to show you that it has a lot to offer and is a great tool to start your tech art journey. Finally, I'd like to highlight Blender's opportunity to grow among 3D artists especially, which, as I'll show you later, is great for tech artists like me. So, uh, here's what you have to know about me. I'm a tech art lead at Crazy Panda. I've spent last uh, three years developing a massive online uh, multiplayer, real-time strategy mobile game called Stellar Age. And basically, I've done a lot uh, on that project because I've started there as a mere programmer and through the years uh, progressed and developed. Uh, I've developed several vital pipelines and every place I went, I tried to make myself obsolete. That is the weird thing to say. Um, during that time, I've had a lot of tools uh, that I had to use. Here are some of them. So you've got uh, Unity, you've got Blender, you've got uh, Goudini, Marmoset Toolbag, Substance Designer and Painter, Resume UV, Sprite UV, Krita, Figma, Google Sheets, and that is just on the top of the list. Uh, point is that I've dabbled in a lot of uh, tools in a very different from the usual way because you see there's like command line, there's Python, there's like Lua and other languages. Uh, and uh, what I want to share here today with you is based on my spilled blood and tears from that time so that you don't have to. So what do tech artists do and what is tech art all about? Um, short answer is pipelines and workflows. Long answer is, is a bit too long for this small presentation, uh, but here's a bite of it. So you've got uh, quality assessment. By the way, I love lists. There's gonna be a lot of lists. Uh, when I am nervous, I like to make a list about what I like about lists. <laughs> so. Uh, quality assessment, which is the amount of polygons, the texture size, so that the art is uh, consistent and pretty. Increasing speed of art production and integration. Uh, then there are art optimizations, art integration optimizations, basically building a bridge between coders, co coders and artists, which is extremely important and very cruel job to do. Uh, shaders, render pipelines, custom geometry generation, custom textures, which is mostly procedural, uh, VFX, and stuff like that. Some might argue that some of these professions like VFX and uh, shader render pipelines, uh, they can be done by a different specialist, like a VFX artist, but uh, a technical artist, due to his uh, generalist nature, can bring a lot to the table. Uh, a VFX artist usually doesn't understand shaders, and shaders can make your effects just pow. So, with all of this said, uh, the key thing to understand about a tech artist is that it is all about saving other people's time, as well as your own. Um, you should try to let people concentrate on the things that they want to achieve rather than the tedious processes of achieving it by understanding tools, and stuff like that. So here are a few examples. Want a racetrack? Well, just move the curve around and you got one. Uh, have a Photoshop sketch that you want to turn into a game level? 
Well, that's easy, just press a button. Need a city fast? Here are a few building generators for you to play around with. Need a complicated terrain with biomes, with roads, rivers, water, grass, trees, buildings, cars, well, I can do that. <laughs> you might think that your game or application doesn't require all of that grandeur, but I believe that you just don't know what you're missing. Because you can do pretty much anything, and uh, the key is that anything that has a standardized input and a standardized output can be automated. And how do you do it? Well, tech artists script custom tools that help to mainstream the pipelines and workflows, basically excluding some people or letting them do their job and then pushing it forward. And when saving time, it's very important to save your own time as well because it is just as important, if not more, considering that there are a lot less tech artists than 3D artists. Yeah. So whenever possible, you should use shortcuts. Uh, and by that I mean third-party applications. Uh, because if there is a tool on the market that does the job for you, then obviously you should use it. At the same time, using third-party applications come with a lot of limitations. Here's another list. Like I said, I love them. Some tools are not common. That means that people that might use your tool are not familiar with like, I know, Blender or Sprite UV or something like that. Uh, some tools are wrong version. Uh, High Blender 2.8 that broke half of my add-ons. Uh, most tools require licenses and that means that you have to persuade your company into using them, into buying licenses. And licenses are usually per seed, so if your company is big or your 3D artists are numerous, uh, not numerous, but like there is a huge amount of them, then that's gonna cost extra, extra for your company. And considering that there are indie licenses usually and uh, corporate licenses, if you, have, uh, if you work in a big company, then that's gonna be extra, extra, extra persuasion, persuasion for you. Yeah. Then the API documentation, API documentation. It can be like Luster. And moreover, you might uh, happen to come to a stumble because of, a, of some unpredicted bug. That's usually not you, that's usually the bug. And uh, the problem with most licensed software is that you can do very little about it. You can do a bug report, but that is not always uh, gonna help you do your job. Open source in that matter is much better. And uh, picking a wrong tool is a huge time waste. But at the same time, every time you see a tool, it's a decision whether you use it or not. You do not have uh, you usually do not have the luxury of knowing the outcome right away. So here are some helpful rules that you might use when picking your tools. So first of all, you should stick to tools people already use in their workflows. That is very important because if they haven't used it, you're gonna have to explain them how to use it. Write a guideline at the very least, or maybe even guide them through the process by yourself, which is a huge time waste. Uh, next is free and open source are your best friends because uh, the chances of you uh, meeting a bug that you can do nothing about are very slim, and uh, you don't have to persuade anyone. You can just use the tool right away. Uh, if the choice is between saving a little time and using less tools, always choose less tools because there's less uh, potential for problems that you cannot solve. Always be on the prowl for new tools and techniques and conferences are great for that. So Blender conference is great. Then you've got a game developer conference, then you've got SIGGRAPH. All of those are amazing places to acquaint yourself with new tools and tricks. And finally, whenever possible, try out new tools and small home projects first because uh, if you try to scale it right away, you're gonna meet a hell of a lot of problems. So, 
this is a conference about Blender, but I barely said anything about it. <laughs> Let's fix it. Blender to the rescue. So what does Blender has to offer to the tech art? One of the key things is its license, because you can just download it and use it. You don't have to persuade anyone at your company. Uh, you can even distribute Blender along with your tool to ensure that it is the correct version. Along with every plugin required too, which is morally dubious but legally sound. And another great benefit is its great API. Uh, you have Python, which is a great language, especially in terms of how much uh, there is for Python. Because you can attach Python modules that are already there, third-party Python modules, and extend the Blender's functionality. From inside your code, you can use almost every nook and cranny of Blender, including extending menus and creating custom operators. Uh, there is also a great plugin for Visual Studio Code that gives you auto-completion. And uh, you can learn the basics of API because Blender outputs almost every action you do at the Python call in its console. Then there's an awesome library of Blender plugins, all of which are open source, which you can learn from, and that is invaluable. Also, there are custom shaders, which can be amazing and help you do your job. And while it's still unusual to see people using Blender for work, there is a huge community of enthusiasts that keeps getting bigger day by day, thanks to you. <laughs> uh, the Blender itself is open source, which means you can make basically anything out of it, should you so desire. There are even custom branches of Blender out in the wild that you might find interesting, and some of them uh, find their way to the main branch. Like, for example, just uh, recently there was a talk about the sculpting branch that I was tracking down for a while. Uh, the one major drawback that I find in Blender is that in the industry, at least where I'm from, it's still not that well used but that's changing fast. And now, back to miracles. Uh, I invite you to delve into one case from our life. So, our game includes a decent amount of 2.5D sprites. These are basically flat 2D images uh, that you can, with Shade of Voodoo, uh, do real-time lighting upon, as well as some other neat 3D things. They are very tedious to make and take a lot of repetition and might not be in work to finish. This is the pipeline, broken into stages. So, for starters, you've got a Marmoset toolbox scene where everything is set up. You've got your 3D models, your lights, your materials, uh, and you have to render them piece by piece, three different ways. First of all, you have to just render the picture. Then you have to render the normal so that you can do lighting later on. And uh, that's not world space normals, that's screen space normals, sorry about that. Uh, and then finally you've got a mission so that you can uh, animate the lights, animate the emission of the materials in the right time in your game. Then you have to pack those renders into atlases and create custom meshes so that uh, you basically recreate the picture. Finally, there's a VFX modification layer where you swizzle atlas channels. For example, RG red and green for normals, blue for roughness, alpha for something else. Uh, adding vertex color so that, like for example, uh, on our global map you have these uh, pirates that do the levitating. And uh, they are desynchronized, the, the parts are desynchronized. To do that, uh, we use vertex color in our shaders. Then you have to create fragmented meshes so that uh, you basically get your destruction for free. Correct pivots, then finally you get to Unity where you can, when you sh where you should create um, your prefabs and uh, render them in the game engine so that the art director can finally make a decision whether this fits it or if it, well, or, or if you should make some changes to it. Yeah, so all of those steps pretty much were done separately and manually. That was 
a huge waste of time, but not anymore since I've done an entire atomized pipeline that automatically takes an art director approved Marmoset scene, renders the meshes inside of it piece by piece into textures three different ways, creates and fills assistant textures, creates and emergent custom meshes for those sprites with correct sorting, creates UVs and packs all of the textures into appropriate atlases, mixes the atlas textures channels into game ready textures, fills the vertex channels of meshes, creates an auto distraction state by using Voronoi noise to split the mesh into big pieces that are then split into tiny pieces and even tinier ones with all, all these correct hierarchies and pivots for auto animation all of that is sent to Unity where prefabs are created, seen automatically set up with the newly created prefabs, screenshots, videos taken, sends a message over email, Skype, Slack, Telegram to the art director with attached screenshots for final decision making and, yeah, oops. <laughs> well, at least in this process. So, before the automatization, 3D artists would finish their work and I had to spend a lot of time basically making those things into game-ready assets so that the art director can make a decision. <sighs> I've already said the entire process two times, so I'd like to skip that tedious part. Um, not only did that take a lot of time, but the results were pretty mediocre since they're done by hand and, I'm jo I, and I am only human. By the way, it could be rejected midway and sent back to the 3D artists to make some adjustments, which means that I had to redo the whole week of depressing work all over again. Good days. <laughs> After the automatization now, suddenly the 3D artists can have complete control. They are always in the loop and they get final feedback immediately. Even if it's not final, they quickly fix what's wrong and in a jiffy, like with the press of a button, we get back to uh, where they, where the art director said, no, no, let's, let's do this. Uh, basically, they got a clone of me in, the, in a box that can in seconds do my work better than I could do in weeks. Aside from pluses I've described, this tool packs atlases like there's no tomorrow, maximizing the texture space usage by a landslide creates all the required textures without a chance for human error, and last but not least, unlike me, it's always available. Aside, uh, yeah, this tool is already battle tested, and while some parts and features of it uh, remain as a to-do list, for example, you have to send emails and messages by yourself, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it does give all the benefits I've described. 3D artists work directly with our director, uh, and I don't have to do a thing. So, in the end, artists and coders living together, mass hysteria. Some things went harder than I thought, though. So, let's take a look at the pipeline one more time uh, and break it down into third-party tools that could do the job required. At the very input, we get uh, a hard limitation. The scene is done in Marmoset toolback, so that is what we're gonna have to use. Uh, for creating atlases and meshes out of images, I found Sprite v 2 which does its job quite well and has a command line support, uh, which is always welcome. Mixing textures can easily be done in Python. For vertex colors, fragmentation, pivot manipulation, and other mesh post-processing, Blender does well. The rest is Unity 3D specific, so Unity 3D it is. The messenger part is not that important. So everything looks great now that we've got our tools and they seem to be able to do the job until it doesn't. Most of the tools do their work as required. Uh, Sprite v 2 has some issues with the pivots it outputs, but that can be fixed later in Blender. Blender loving it, plus it can be included into the tool itself, which is awesome. Unity loving it. Marmoset though, not so much. <laughs> and let, you show, let, let me show you some of my sorrows. But before that, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with it, let me explain to you what Marmoset Toolback is. Um, so it's a tool for look development that a lot of the artists use due to its uh, simple UX. Uh, basically, you send your models there, uh, just set up the materials, uh, pick the required shader, pick the required touch DRI, put on some lights here and there, and then you can export it straight to ArtStation and export a package that you can then upload to Sketchfab. That's where it wins. 
it also has a surprisingly decent Python support along with custom GLSL-esque shader support. Uh, that was a welcome sight because without it, I wouldn't be able to do my job. Yeah, but there were some problems. Uh, first issue I've encountered are custom passes. So to do what I needed, I needed to extract screen space normals and emission passes. Emission passes, well, they went rather well, but the normals, well, uh, this is an article from AT level uh, where a, an author, the author, Alexandre, uh, explains how he uh, extracted the screen space normals. So it comes, so you basically what you should do, you should set up three lights and you should uh, twinkle with the material settings and then add this curve and then finally, hopefully, you, you get what you need. <laughs> uh, by the way, the curve that you see there will, will come to it later and you'll see that it is no coincidence. Anyways, I've tried it. The results were subpar and hard to implement via Python. Uh, they required quite a lot of changes in material and lighting and I've given up before finishing a stable version of it. So what I did instead was create custom shaders for both paths. Screen space normals gave me still one hell of a ride. Just in case, let me clarify to you what screen space normals are. So inside a normal map texture, uh, most of the time you have a tangent space normals. These are dependent on the geometry normals. When rendering things into flat sprites, you lose surface normals altogether, so you can't just render unlit normal map and call it a day. What you should do instead is unwrap it and flatten it. Marmoset does the unpacking of the normal map for custom shaders out of the box, but it only provides the sum space normals. We'll get to that soon. Uh, usually to convert those to what you need, you have out of the box matrices for such cases. Uh, examples are object to world, view to world, etc. Most of the 3D tools I've used have those. For example, in Blender, you can do this transformation with one simple node. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> in Marmoset, though, you have no such thing. You can't even multiply a vector by a matrix as is in your GSL, GLSL code. That, that's why it's ESC at the end. Well, to be frank, while these are never mentioned, uh, there are two interesting shader files containing uh, those things. Uh, those are utils, which has methods for vector matrix m uh, multiplication. So including it gives you that. And custom extras has some matrices with funky names like you custom shading to world and you custom shading to model. Yeah, custom shading, more fun. Uh, there is some documentation on that commented in the code. Transforms from shading to world space and the other one is from shading to model. Still doesn't explain what shading is, and we'll get to that as well. As is, after trial and error, I created a view matrix by passing forward, up, and left camera object vectors from Python, multiplied normals by the resulting matrix, and thus my world space normals were complete. Or so I thought. After uh, importing the, results, uh, the, the resulting atlases into the game engine, I found issues with the resulting normals. They seemed a little bit off. Yeah, this is where we get back to that curve that the article author did. There are different color spaces for image files. Uh, when a file is saved to sRGB, a gamma correction is applied to it. Fun fact, the inverse of gamma correction curve looks very similar to the one the article author came up with to make his, world space, uh, make his screen space normals look better. Kudos to his sense of beauty. <laughs> Anyways, it's easy to fix when you know exactly the problem, but can be extremely frustrating when you do not. Uh, it took me a while to figure out the culprit behind the inconsistencies. Marmoset writes PNG files only in sRGB format, hence the gamma correction is applied to the files automatically. To save myself from the trouble of working with EXR files or finding that you can't export them uh, via Python from Marmoset, I've included an inverse gamma correction curve into the shader itself and all was well. Well, until it wasn't. 
Turns out, the world is a lie. The, in Marmoset, you have this hierarchy, the visible hierarchy, uh, where objects are rooted to something and presumably it should be all rooted to the world, but instead it is rooted to an HDRI object that you can rotate in a different menu altogether. So once again, after a lot of trial and error, I finally pinpointed the problem and fixed it. It was rather easy to fix because of those two wonderful files and custom shading. Apparently, when you multiply your uh, resulting normals, uh, normals by the U custom uh, shading to world matrix, you have found the solution. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Blender, <laughs> might I remind you that all of this can be done with just one node, one very, very simple node that you can do like in several places. Yeah. But that was not the end of my problems. Uh, this is a huge issue that I still do not, have not found a correct way to fix. Um, while when working with a batch of new art assets, one of which you can see here, um, I've noticed that I can't just disable objects to render them piece by piece because that would affect shadows and that would affect global illumination and that would change the visuals so that that would be very problematic. Um, and on this object it became very obvious. None of the easy fixes I came up with worked, neither the hard ones I've tried so far. One of the obvious solutions for this would be baking complete lighting and Hey, what do you know? Marmoset Toolback has a baker for that. I wish I could say victory by default, but yeah, there's a bug. Uh, so, turns out it doesn't care about normal maps when calculating light. So the results it produces were not what I wanted out of it. And unlike Blender, where hypothetically I could fix it by myself without having to wait for the fix, for the official fix, here I could not. Moreover, uh, there's a topic on it, on a very different side, because Marmoset doesn't have an official forum. And uh, the post there were dates almost a year back, so my hopes of it being fixed are very slim. Meanwhile, in Blender, you can do it with just one toggle. Granted, it's Cycles, not Eevee. I believe that Eevee cannot do that, but in Blender, in Cycles, you can do practically anything, like turn off uh, the solid rendering, turn off the shadows, turn off this, turn off that, because all of it is done through different passes. So after all is said and done, and we finally have our tool in the working order, I've had a lot of uh, the problems while dealing with Marmoset. Funky documentation, weird features, bugs. Every step of the way, I saw how I could do this or that much easier has it been Blender scenes. But they weren't. And while I am rooting for Blender, and I, uh, I am rooting for Blender, and I wanted to become better, and I wanted to be Blender scenes. Uh, but I see how that was not the case and how it couldn't have been. It has everything to do with the UX of the tools themselves and that's what I want to concentrate the rest of my talk. Marmoset, in my humble opinion, has a much simpler and user-friendly interface when it comes to look development. First of all, I'd like to direct your attention towards HDRI Lightning. In Marmoset, adding HDRI-based lighting is extremely intuitive. You easily set up an environment texture from one of the built-ins, define simple image-based lights to further customize the scene, easily correct brightness of HDRI image-based lights, and while not perfect, I find it to be a big step up in terms of usability against Blender's environment texture setup, and especially lights. Uh, then you've got shaders, and while I love the node structure of Blender shaders, um, Marmoset allows to customize its principal shader quite a bit. 
the shader is split into categories. For each category, you have several choices. Do you want a simple diffuse, a Lambert, or Dota diffuse for your diffusion? Do you want a Dota specular, specular, or metalness for your reflectivity, etc.? These are very intuitive for people, uh, especially for artists. And uh, to get a good surface shader going for an artist in Blender, well, that takes a lot of guts. Uh, also, ArtStation and Sketchfab integration. Well, Blender does uh, work to do that easier. I believe that this is a good place to create a plugin to just mainstream your renders into uh, to ArtStation or to maybe even YouTube, who knows. And then there's lighting. And lighting in Blender is quite complicated. Uh, in Blender's EV light object has no modifiable attenuation curve that I know of, although I did find some ways to fake it, but uh, the control on that is rather lackluster. Um, also, the light's brightness power inversely depends on its size radius, and it's a rather weird side when you know you increase the radius of the light and suddenly it becomes dimmer rather than, well, you expect it to be brighter because it gets closer to the object that it's supposed to highlight. Uh, those are the things that my colleagues found weird. And summing things up, um, tech art is awesome. A good tech artist can make uh, your five 3D artists produce more content than 50 3D artists would. Blender is a great tool for doubling in tech art due to its free and open source nature with a great Python support along with a good coding environment and lots of examples to learn from. Blender is already a great tool for a lot of people working different jobs in very different industries. 3D modeling, animating, rendering, look dev, scripting, motion design, movies, VFX, and much more in it. I love that Blender is gaining momentum, and I want to help it grow. One such improvement is Eevee, because it allows Blender to compete as a look dev and portfolio tool uh, due to its, like, you s what you see is what you get nature. And uh, Marmoset is extremely popular, and I believe that uh, if uh, Blender were to add an entire different workspace for just simple lighting and simple shading, that would uh, provide the starting 3D artists with a better way to engage with the software. And the tool that people use at home is the tool that they will eventually use at work. Yeah, I missed that. <laughs> so, uh, one of the key pros that I find in Blender is its diverse community. Because you don't just have 3D artists, you have basically everyone, including coders, that can create plugins and can even create custom branches that then get into the main branch. So basically, Blender is what we make it to be. So, you have all the power to do it even better. And there are a lot of uh, examples that I can give that just made I uh, enjoy vanilla blender but there are some plugins that I just uh, see as uh, a requirement for blender like there's box cutter that made my modeling much easier there's decal ops that uh, made it much easier like you can almost entirely skip uh, the high poly phase and just on the low poly create all the details that you want from it. Quite fast, quite easy. So community is, I believe, what drives Blender and what should drive Blender to its much brighter future. Thank you for listening. I hope I've shown you an interesting topic to explore and some ideas on how Blender could get even better and more common among the industry. Thank you. <laughs>